All right. Why don't you go ahead and get started, Dr. Nick? And um, if you will come in late, they'll, uh, I'm sure they'll catch up. Okay. Well, um, welcome to um, Center Court 360. Uh, I'm Dr. Nick Molinaro. Um, some of the names here I don't recognize, so this may be the first time you're having the opportunity to become familiar with my work. So we'll go through a couple of things here. I'm just going to show you some of my um, background. And so while, I'm, while that's occurring, I'm just going to speak with you. As a sports psychologist, my responsibility is to help an athlete um, recover from injuries. And those are not necessarily psychological ones. They are physiological ones as well. And in addition to that, it's also to bring the athlete to higher levels of performance using their mental skills. We're eventually going to be looking over about 20 or so mental skills. Most people don't even know that there's 20 or so mental skills, and we'll take a look at that the, this evening. But before we begin that, I wanna just go through a couple of warm-up exercises to help you become more open-minded to what you're gonna hear this evening. So if you'd unmute, unmute your mics, that would be great. There's only several of us in this meeting this evening. That'd be great. And um, if you decide not to unmute your mics, then um, that's fine, but it would be great if you could. In any case, what I'm showing you here is a couple of images. So it'd be great if you could tell me what you say. Anyone dare to say? Pac-Man eating away at the top corners of the square. Okay, anybody else? It's not a psychological test, so don't be afraid. In any case, probably most of you see the square in the center, and you may see Pac-Man around the corners. Some people actually see the white square on top of the black circles, cutting off you know, a quarter of the circle. If you watch this, you'll see that there was no square there in the first place. So the reason for this is two. One is to use this as a metaphor for what the truth is and not what you see. And the other is in terms of what's called attentional shifting. So in all sports, in open sports, you have to have very quick attentional shifting. And in closed sports, you don't have to shift your attention very frequently. So the reason I'm showing this to begin with is to just give you a little opportunity to see some of the work that we're gonna be going through tonight and most of it's really around what's called attentional shifting. Which letter does not belong? So anybody wanna give a guess about which letter doesn't belong there? K. A? Which one, the K? Okay. I'm gonna say the T. Oh, did you see this before? No, I haven't. <laughs> most people don't see the T. Very good, Conrad. Cool. Now, um, most people haven't seen the T. But so the reason that we use this is what's called metacognition, which is to think about your thinking. So the way that you answer this is that you have to think outside the box. And part of what we're going to be looking at this evening is how thinking actually influences high-level performance perhaps even in practice, maybe not so much during competition, but depending upon whether it's open sport or closed sport, thinking will occur. High levels of performance requires no thinking, and that most people describe as muscle memory. And most people will be shocked to understand that there's no such thing as muscle memory. We're probably talking about the same thing, but there's no such thing as muscle memory. And I can prove that to you. Cut off your head and see how much memory you have left. All memory is stored in your brain and not in your muscles. And I'm gonna give you an example of that, particularly as we're looking at the differences between open and closed sports. Why study open and closed sports? The reason for that is that sports, uh, sports actually influence our ability to develop what's called executive functioning. So executive functioning 
affects what's going on in development, um, children, adolescents, all the way up through adults. So we're studying this so you can understand the impact that executive functioning has on sport performance, and more importantly, how it has effects on performance uh, in life. Now, in my other career, uh, I am also a performance psychologist and I work in industry. And the reason I work in industry is that I work with companies, high-level companies of Fortune 500, the top 200 companies, some actually one of the top 10. And the reason I work with them is because they know I can assess them in understanding who are the high-level performers in sport because athletes have a background in working with teams and in leadership and performing under pressure. So one of the things I'm looking for in in their performance are what we're describing as executive functions. These are an example of the eight executive functions. So impulse control, emotional control. I'll be making a presentation on Monday on emotional regulation in sport, self-monitoring, task initiation, working memory, flexible thinking, prioritization and planning and organization. We're going to be looking a little bit at executive functions and how it influences performance across the board. So the reason that sports psychologists are looking at the difference between open and closed sports and why we're doing our work in the first place is to train executive functioning so under pressure, athletes can perform at a very high level. Now we look at two different forms of executive functioning. One is called the cool executive functioning, which is relatively abstract, non-affective conditions, which means these are not emotional conditions. So the executive functionings that we're looking at here are ones where are describing, you know, your memory, thinking, planning, organization, task initiation. When we look at the hot ones, motivation, which are affected by emotions, impulse control, your monitoring and your ability to initiate tasks being able to stop them and move forward and not have emotions start to interfere. So hopefully just from the beginning of this, you can understand why as a psychologist, I'm involved with high level performance, looking at how athletes use their ability to analyze data uh, in these areas of executive functions. Do we have any questions so far? This was a study done in 2014, and it's a good example of what happens in our assessments of executive functions. And here's some basic highlights. Uh, they tested executive functioning, those areas, and it's very obvious that athletes outperform non-athletes on problem solving. So when people say, why is sport important? And you're gonna hear people say it's only a game. And those of us that are involved in sports throughout our life, we understand this goes so much further than just winning or just playing a game. Self-paced athletes, swimmers, scored highest on inhibition. Inhibition in sport means the ability to stop yourself from being distracted or being influenced by other factors that are not relevant. Now, in swimming, which is a closed sport, no one's gonna to try to knock you down, um, but it's self-paced, which means that you have the responsibility of moving yourself through the water as quickly as you can and inhibiting responses that might start to influence that. And that inhibition would be uh, qualities of thinking, anxiety, emotional regulation. Externally paced athletes such as soccers, they scored, let's move this, highest on problem solving. So it's pretty interesting to see that when we take a look at cognitive processes, your cognitive processes are actually being developed in sport. One of the reasons why cross training is so important in open and closed sports is that you're gonna be using different processes in order to influence your um, executive functions. So let me stop here and see if you have any questions so far. Okay.
Now, the reason I'm going to start off with the brain, even before we get to open and close sports, is that you saw some things around the idea of executive functions. Now, this is a PET scan, and PET scans measure the heat of the brain. Now, you can't feel heat in your brain because there's no heat receptors. But the PET scan here is assessing what's happening with thinking that's negative and actually interfering then with what's going on emotionally. Why is this important in sports? Well, the first thing that goes away when your brain starts to heat up caused by anxiety, anger, frustration, is that the ability to assess information, to analyze data actually starts to go away. So if you're under pressure, let's take a look at a quarterback, and I'm not just talking about the pressure of what's happening with the defensive line coming in, but the pressure of the score, and he's now trying to analyze what's the play he wants to use next, or even in the moment. If this starts to occur, if he's not regulating his emotions effectively, the first thing that's gonna go away is his ability to analyze the data. Same thing with the linebacker. So we're now looking at open sports. We can certainly look at closed sports like golf. In closed sports like golf, what this will do is that it will, it will do in all sports, will actually tense your muscle groups. Now, let's take a look at tennis. And Conrad, if you'd like to join in at any point, please feel free to do so. So when you're serving, you have to, sure, toss, doc. The ball. You toss the ball in a, in a very specific way. I'm not going to demonstrate that because I can't play tennis. But when you take the racket back, you're going to tense certain muscle groups and you're going to relax other muscle groups and do the opposite when you, when you hit the ball. Now, the first thing that goes away when your brain tenses up is your ability to regulate those emotions, those muscles effectively. So what will actually happen to the athlete in all sports, depending upon the severity of this, is that you will lose agility, speed, um, power and strength. So you can imagine if this is what's taking place in any athlete, open, closed sports, this will profoundly influence performance. Now this is what the brain is supposed to look like. And this is gone, this is an individual who actually happened to be a golfer and after he's gone through training, we can now see that his, his functioning of his brain is very different. And as a result of his performance will actually go up. So let me give you a, an opportunity here again to um, ask any questions. Conrad, any comments? Yeah, look, I think um, the question that I would have or the comment I would have is open, closed sports um, being physical skills um, are obviously, in terms of the continuum, are more difficult at various age groups. Um, what role does the other aspects of the sport play in the open and closed continuum? For example, in a sport like tennis, where you have technical component is one of the five um, key components of the game. You obviously have the technical, the mental, the physical, the emotional, and then finally you have the character of the athlete. So my question would be, in terms of the continuum of open and closed, what role do those other aspects, non-physical, have um, in the mental state of athletes? Well, you can see, first of all, from this one, that one of the things that's going to happen is that you're not going to be able to analyze the information as effectively. And so where you're going to be placing a ball on the court or anticipation, so we always look at anticipation, right? And we look at visual tracking, you know, with, uh, with tennis players, you know, versus golfers, you know, how they have to train tennis players to do that. So it will definitely affect, if, if we just look at the functioning of the brain, it will definitely affect your ability to track the ball, your, your ability to anticipate the tension that's occurring within the body to get you over there quickly enough. So a simple, a simple fact that what happens when you become anxious, all of those are going to be affected. So we can look at this both in terms of cognitive process thinking. So if you're thinking about something like, am I going to win or am I going to score the point? Or if you are, are emotionally affected, you're frustrated or angry. Both of these things are occurring coincidentally, but one starts this, right? So either the cognition, how will I perform, or the emotion will produce either of those things. And that affects other aspects of the game 
certainly cognitively and physiologically. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank you, Doc. Yeah. So this is what the brain is supposed to look like. Now, on Monday in my course on emotional regulation, we'll spend more time in trying to figure out, well, how do we get a brain to act like this? And it's going to be something a little bit more than just kind of relaxing. I'm going to bring up this graph and then we're going to start looking at open and closed sports. And then certainly as Conrad had talked about the continuum, he can, he's an expert of that. He can tell us, help us a little bit with that in a little while. So this is a performance graph and you can see that performance goes from low to high. The ZOF is the zone of optimal functioning. So my job as a performance sports psychologist is to get athletes here and stay there for as long as possible. You'll see on the bottom here, the sections which are marked arousal and anxiety. So the first half of the graph is arousal. This is psyching yourself up. So before performance, you know, particularly in open sports, you know, where someone's going to try to stop you from performing and you have to respond to them. Noise is a very, very effective way of getting arousal up. That's why you hear a lot of noise um, in sports that are open, uh, the stands, cheerleaders, because information that's coming through your ears actually affects your brain and the limbic system and helps you get psyched up. In closed sports, we want things to be quiet. And tennis is a combination of open and closed sports. That's why it's so quiet, you know, except for the uh, athlete who might be shouting a little bit and then finally the stands getting involved in it. Now we have the second portion of the graph is what's called anxiety. You can see that as the arousal goes up, so does your performance. As the anxiety goes up, your performance drops off. But a very interesting finding here is high arousal and low anxiety produces the same degree of high performance. So if you imagine an Olympic athlete, um, just before they get started, there's gonna be some degree of anxiety, even a junior um, athlete. Before the event begins, we know that there's some realm of anxiety that they're experiencing. Now, a low degree of anxiety can actually help performance at a very high, perform at a very high level. But if that anxiety starts to get greater, it starts to drop off. Now what we notice about this is that if your attention is on the outcome, the only time you cannot be anxious is when the event is over, when the point is scored, when the game is over. So we always want to stay process focused and we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that in each one of the sports. Process focus keeps you performing at a very high level. Outcome focus produces anxiety, which is detrimental to your overall performance. Any questions so far? All sit on this continuum. And I think this, there's several continuums that we can look at. This is the open and closed continuum. And so open here, closed, and you have sports that actually can be in the middle. The reason that we wanna look this over is to understand what are the factors that influence performance at a high level in each of those. So that can affect uh, both the parents uh, and the coaches uh, in understanding what's going on. Open, sport, open sports are ones that require in the moment kind of processes because what's gonna be taking place is that you have to modify your responses based upon what other people are doing. So in essence, you know, the environment uh, is what's influencing the athlete versus in a close sport when you see when we get to golf and to tennis just to begin with when they're serving. But in an open sport, there are factors that are occurring um, coincidentally. There's a number of decisions that have to be made because the reaction of the athlete is based upon what the other athlete is doing. This is an example of a closed sport. And in this portion of the, this assessment, we're looking at the fact that this individual is actually controlling the rate of their performance. It's all inherent in them because it's not being stimulated by what somebody else is doing to them. That's why this is called a closed sport. Here is a basketball game. And in this situation, the basketball player 
is in the middle where the environment is affecting her. So another player or even the clock might be affecting her. And so things that are outside the individual also are affecting them where this is much more kind of centralized to the athlete. And this is an interesting example, a wheelchair racer. They have to have an awareness of what's going on. They're gonna be able to move you know, in front of someone, but all of their activity is self-generated. They will react to someone trying to pass them. So it's kind of in the middle. And that's an example of what the continuum is from closed to open sports. Open sports, interesting is described as a skill which is performed in unstable environments. So things are moving, things are changing. Um, it's not one who chooses the skill and movement because you have to be able to respond to what your opponent is doing. Someone is actually gonna to try to stop you from doing what you're trying to do. It's very different than golf. So um, in team-based, we see a great deal of movements, movements by many, member, many members of the team. Um, and even things that would affect that are terrain and actually the weather. So there are factors that are kind of unstable that are influencing the individual and how they're gonna perform on a wet field versus a dry field, certainly a clay court versus a hard true uh, court will make all the differences in how you're going to perform in open motor, open motor sports, open motor skill sports. Any questions so far? Is there examples of open motor skills? Um, object manipulation. So the object is the uh, individual, you know, like in the basketball, uh, the rim doesn't move and neither does the goal for the goalie. But objects are people that are going to be influencing your performance. Space parameters, it's an open space, things are kind of fluid, group performance. You know, this high intertrial variability means, let's take a look at hockey. So someone's trying to take the puck away, you can continuously use the same skill to try to move that away. In closed sports, you get one shot. But in an open sports, a very interesting concept is that you have many more trials of being able to use the process of your skill set in order to modify the outcome of the performance. Simultaneous oppositional performance. So in open sports, the opposition and oneself is continuously moving, but they're occurring simultaneously. In closed sports, that's not the case. And multitasking and tasking more than two or three things at one time is very characteristic of open motor skills sports. This is an example of um, what happens with a football player. Let's take a look at a quarterback. Now, what we see here is that there are opportunities. One, something's missing here. Oh, there it is. There we go. So um, a quarterback has to be able to look at what's going on around them in a very broad way. So we call that broad external attention. They have to be gathering information from things that are going on all around them. They also have to be able to narrow their attention down. So whether it's a quarterback or a linebacker, they have to see the field and be able to move their attention very quickly to a narrow way without even spending time thinking. So that kind of cognitive process which we're going to describe as attentional shifting, they have to be very, very fluid. The same thing in tennis, um, because the opponent's going to try to move the ball strategically to get their opponent in a very in another place. In soccer, so open sports, you can see that there's a great deal of variability, which is occurring with your attention only by what's caused outside of you, external attention. Now, there's an internal attention process and this is where thinking takes place. This is where you're bringing the information inside of you. So a quarterback 
will be assessing the situation, if he has enough time, he might actually have a thought and be able to shift his attention very quickly and execute. But most of what's going on is occurring like this. However, when the quarterback gets back into the huddle, he's been observing what's been going on. And then even when he's doing an audible, what happens is he's gathered the information very broadly, maybe narrowed because he might see that they're going to be blitzing. He then gathers the information, brings it inside. And at this point, this is where some analysis is going on. And then he comes up with an interpretation about what's next. And then he narrows his attention down and he executes. Now you'll see this red line here. And this means that you cannot be in the middle of a thought and execute before you actually narrow the thought down. Sometimes things like this occur when something, when a man goes offside or when there's a false start or the quarterback actually starts to back away without having the ball in his hands because he's actually executed before he finally narrowed his attention down. So in open sports, open sports are plays, played mostly up here, which is external attention, awareness, and from a very broad perspective to a very narrow perspective, and back and forth and back and forth without a lot of concentration. Now, in a serve, in tennis, you have the opportunity to have assess what's going on with your opponent and bring your attention inside and say, okay, so it's gonna to go to this corner of the box or that corner of the box, or I'm going to do this and my next move is gonna be doing that. So there's a possible time for here for attention uh, to actually analyze the data narrow your attention down and execute. So that's what occurs in open sports. Uh, this model was developed by Dr. Neidefer, uh, who was my mentor. And if you ever find out who Dr. Neidefer is, he's a world-renowned uh, sports psychologist. And um, his tribute to sports psychology has been um, solo adventurous. So those people will go out on their own, no food, and you know maybe a knapsack and try to figure their way back. Um, but that's who Nidifer is. So this is his model for open sports. I'll show you the one for closed in a little while. So let me give you an opportunity to ask me any questions before I go any further. Okay. Closed skills. Um, it's in a stationary environment. And so what this means is that the athlete has the responsibility of starting the movement. So if we look at a gymnast, you know, the, whether it's the pummel horse or the rings or the uneven parallels or the balance beam or even where the um, dance portion takes place, that's fixed, nothing changes. And the athlete initiates, nobody tries to interrupt this. So in a closed sport, you can see that the information, a lot of which is gonna start internally, you know, versus what's going on in an, in an open sport where everything is really starting on the outside. Um, typically an individual sport is able to dictate the skill that they're gonna use and how they're gonna execute. And, um, there's less variability, so they don't have to have as much of the attentional shifting as I just gave the example, either in tennis or football, certainly in soccer or basketball, where things are changing. So you can get a sense now when I started explaining what's going on with exec executive functioning and why a psychologist works with players and teams is to help a player learn how to use their attention effectively, how to shift their attention swiftly, how to make decisions based upon nuances, how to anticipate visual stimulation, that kind of thing. So that's why we're looking all at executive functioning based upon open and closed sports. These are examples of a closed sport, so nothing's really changing, right? So the golf course doesn't change, the flag doesn't change for um, each shot at the hole or for each player. They'll change it over days, but they won't change that in the middle of the sporting event. Things aren't really moving. Um, so the manipulation is very, very specific. There's a defined space and time. So in gymnasts, they have so much time to do their event. 
uh, and uh, in golf, it's based upon the uh, finishing of 18 holes. Individual. Now, there's a higher intertrial consistency. When we saw an intertrial variability in sport, in the open sport, where the um, hockey stick can be manipulated over and over and over again, you can't do that in golf. You can't do that in gymnastics. You can't do that in archery. So you have the opportunity here to be very, very consistent. And it's going to be very dependent on those one or two events that you're doing that becomes cumulative, you know, for the entire event. Sequential opposition, which means one person goes and then the other person goes. So in golf, you can see how that works. Um, in gymnastics, you can see how that works. Nobody's really trying to knock you down. The same thing with ice skating. Um, and it's typically a, a, C, a single task. So let me give you a couple of moments here to ask any questions so far about any of the differences between open and closed sport. Um, Dr. Nick, can I ask you a quick question? Oh, please. How would you um, prioritize the training priorities at various age groups. For example, we all know tennis is an extremely open skilled sport. Um, and at the younger age groups, you're obviously prioritizing technical skill versus at the more competitive levels where you're prioritizing more strategy and, and mental approach. Um, is it similar for other sports or how, how do you prioritize, you know, when to focus on various areas to become proficient in those various sports? Excellent question, Conrad, thanks. Now, you know that um, probably in your training, which is different that goes on, that what has been going on in the US, is that there's training to train, training to learn, and then training for competition. So certainly what I would say, even with open sports, the best way to do that is to do it in a closed way, right? So a person is serving and that the serve's not being returned so that we don't actually get into the competitive aspect or trying to shift even into the open aspect of that so that you train with the closed aspect first, right? So uh, the ability to switch directions or hit backhand or overhand, overhead. Um, so what we wanna do then is that the sequence of skills then are closed portion of that before you actually get into a competitive nature. Now you can look at different developmental stages and cognitive processes are gonna make a big difference in that. So the ability to shift your attention, if you start at a very early age and learn how to do that, it's gonna be a lot easier when you finally get into more of the open aspects of the performance when someone's hitting the ball back at you. So in, in that example, in closed, uh, in, in open skill sports, we wanna start with kind of the closed aspects of it first of all. And as a person is developing that at a higher level, then we start to introduce uh, the opponent or the opposition uh, in training. That's the way I would describe that. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay. We're now going to be looking at a closed sport, and I happen to pick golf. Um, and uh, I didn't start playing golf until I was 50, I'm uh, now 70. And even though I've been playing golf for 20 years, I still play like I'm not a golfer. Um, the interesting thing about golf is because it's a closed sport. And one of the factors about golf versus almost any other sport, uh, if you play golf, you probably know that a golf swing is between 1.3 to 1.5 seconds. If you're to shoot par, that means that it's about 90 seconds worth of a golf swing. I'm not talking about practices, but actual strokes in competition is about 90 seconds in a four and a half hour round of golf. Now there's no other sport that's like that where you have such a small amount of time to execute and perform at a very high level. So you can imagine what the concentration is like and how you can't afford to be distracted during that 1.3 to 1.5 seconds. So in golf and in any closed sport, the process goes from external gathering information to something internal. We don't do 
see the ball, hit the ball in golf. That's why we don't do uh, broad awareness, narrow awareness. You don't do that in golf. And you actually don't do that in some aspects of tennis. So in the closed aspects of tennis, when your opponent's not hitting towards you and you're serving, you actually initiate. So, and that's the section of uh, tennis and, and some sports are both open and closed. That's what happens there. So in golf, we don't see the ball, hit the ball. You might focus a little bit on, on the hole, even when you're on a, on a tee, but for the most part, golf is played by gathering of the information. And then the next step is to bring your attention inside and say, what am I going to do? You analyze conditions such as the wind, such as it's, uh, you, you know, is it a dog leg left or a dog leg right? Is there out of bounds or is there a hazard? Is the wind coming into you? Is it with you? And so all of what's going on here for those four and a half hours uh, is taking place a lot in what's going on with thinking. And before I forget to mention this, uh, the human has 80,000 thoughts a day. Now, think about how that's going to influence your performance in a closed sport when you have more time to think, let alone what's going on in an open sport where things are occurring very quickly. But 80,000 thoughts a day, about 3,000 thoughts an hour. So what's important here then is you gather information, you bring it in, then you might go back out and gather more information, you might even take a look down the fairway or look at the hole if you're on the green. You eventually bring your attention inside, you narrow it down and then you execute. So golf is played in a U shape versus open sports that are, are played, you know, in a cross here way from, from uh, broad attention and narrow attention back and forth and back and forth. So that's the process. I think you can see that the difference in thinking and executive functions for what's going on in decision-making in open sports versus the decision-making that goes on in closed sports is tremendously different. And that's why open sport athletes have a greater ability, generally speaking, in executive functioning, because they're required to do something that, that closed sport athletes don't do. So in my work in corporations, and I'm evaluating people for high levels of performance, and a lot of them are athletes for the reasons that we're talking about, I then take a look at the sport that they're in and take a look at how that might impact some of the decision-making in um, business as well. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, um, so there are many different continuums and um, I just see that I wrote continuum, continuum. And so I must confess I'm dyslexic. Uh, my reading is terrible and I didn't even notice that until just now. So if you see any grammatical errors or uh, syntax or spelling errors, it's because of my uh, you know, learning disability. We can look at many different continuums. I don't wanna spend a lot of time in this right now I'll show these to you just to help you understand that there's many things that are going on cognitively that's influencing performance and that occurs at such a rapid pace, certainly in open sports, but in closed sports, you still need to be able to gather that information in a very specific way. That's the reason that psychologists are involved to help athletes perform by looking at their executive functioning, emotional regulation, which we're gonna talk about on Monday is an extremely important one. Not, on, not, a, not any more important or less important than your ability to shift your attention quickly, visually, in tracking, which occurs in um, open sports. This is a model of how you make decisions, and it's my model, and basically it tells us that if you're going to perform at a high level, you have to have an intention. Your intention drives your attention, your attention drives your decision-making, your behavior. This is what's occurring in sport and it's occurring in everyday life. Now, I'm sure you've read a paragraph, you don't remember what you've read. And if I suggest it to you, go read a new paragraph and find the two most important points. You would read that paragraph differently. Well, how about an athlete? Or intending to win at times, winning's fine, but if your intention is not in the moment on what you have to do, you can intend on winning all you want to, but if you're not directing your attention to the execution. So let's take a look at tennis again. In the ability to shift your attention very quickly visually and shift your attention cognitively, you have to be able to anticipate. And so maybe you're looking at 
<clears throat> you know, the stance of your opponent. Or maybe you're looking at hip movement or shoulder movement. And in hockey, maybe you're looking at hip movement or maybe you're looking at the stick. But you have to intend on getting your attention in the correct place. Not unlike what happens when you don't remember what you've read because your attention was what, where it wasn't, where it should have been. Your intention didn't drive you there. The same thing is occurring in all sports. We want to make sure in training athletes cognitively about how to do this, and that's part of what I do, is how to, how to get you to shift your attention quickly or how not to be distracted. So in open sports, you want to be distracted to a certain extent, but not totally. Now, this is my model of um, high-level performance. Just as I explain the intention, what I start with is taking a look at personality factors and values. Well, are there certain personality factors of open sport athletes compared to closed sport athletes? Yes. First of all, open sport athletes are more gregarious. They're more extroverted than closed sport athletes. Now, since that's the case, what does that tell us about their interaction in the environment? Well, in interpersonal relationships, you have to pick up a lot of cues. You have to be looking at affectual responses, emotional responses. In closed sports, you don't have to do that because you don't have an opponent. So right from the start, what we know about open sport athletes, for the most part, they're much more um, uh, extroverted than introverted. You might not have taken that into consideration, but that is the absolute truth. Certainly values will affect the inner dynamics of what then affects your intention or the purpose of what you're doing. That will drive your attention. And then we just go through the model that I just showed you with Nidafer. Um, you know, so we're looking at broad external attention, narrow external attention, broad internal, narrow internal. So you can see that my model says that in my work with high performing athletes, I need to understand personality factors and values. I need to understand their cognitive processes, how that affects what they're deciding to do before we actually get into the training of how to use their mind effectively and perform at a higher level. A lot of information. Um, any questions so far? Now this is a test that I give that helps me measure the factors that are essential in decision making at a high level. Test was standardized on Olympic athletes and it's used with the Navy SEALs and it's also used in business. All of what I've been talking about is what happens with your attention, what factors influence that. So in an open sport, we have to be very reactive. There are certain factors that we want you to be able to use very differently than what goes on in closed sports. So if you can see down here, uh, the decision-making style score of 21, the lower that number, the quicker the decision-making speed, the higher that number, the slower. So in open sports, we want people to be able to make very quick decisions. In closed sports, we don't want them to do that. So the way in which you gather the information and the tendency about how you make decisions will significantly influence your performance. So we have someone who's a slow decision maker, but as a quarterback, that's gonna be a problem. And similarly, if someone who's making a very quick decision, if they're a golfer, that will be a problem. So from this assessment, we can start looking at personality factors that will tell us what's gonna influence performance, such as decision-making speed, or even in their awareness, or their ability to shift attention. This score here is where attentional shifting is measured. The lower the number, the quicker the attention is able to be shifted. So if we have someone who inherently is slow in being able to shift their attention and slow in making decisions, and now expecting them to perform at a higher level, they can have the skill set. But their performance is going to have to be modified by teaching them how to shift their attention quicker, how to make their decision making quicker as well. So there's too many of these to go over now because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, and uh, goodbye. Goodbye, Matt. I'm sorry. Um, so um, there's too many of these to go over to explain this to you. I'm actually doing a program now that's a four-week program where I've tested 
the members of the group. And then over the next four weeks, I'm training them uh, to perform at a higher level. The next time that rolls around, it might be interesting for you guys to take a look at that as an opportunity to understand how this test will predict your performance under pressure and what cognitive skills are necessary to do so. All right, I'll stop for a minute or two here. Are there any questions? Do you want to ask me anything about the testing and how we use it? Dr. Nick, I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind, I apologize for asking all the questions. Um, I'm glad. Somebody's asking me questions. Good. <laughs> uh, my question is related to when you're developing players mentally, uh, which we all know how important mental skill training is, um, do you have certain tests that you do off, off the playing arena that you could um, suggest that we use? Because obviously... Uh, in the sport like tennis, which I'm involved in, personality is very important, you know, in the way we develop that player, whether there are various game styles. So we might develop a, an aggressive baseliner. So their personality has to match the game style. We might develop uh, what we call a counter-punching, more, more sort of defensive style of player. And again, the personalities generally match that game style. So yeah. do, you, do you have any... Um, ways or means that you do this type of testing for athletes that you might be able to share with us? Yes, this is the test you're looking at. And I'd be glad to have you take it, Conrad, so you can see the efficacy of this. So uh, for example, um, right now I'm working with a, a, who was gonna be an Olympic camera thrower. He was in the 2016 Olympics and clearly we're not doing it for this season, uh, for this uh, competition, but we will. So one of the things we would be looking at is you know, things like um, aggressiveness or risk taking. Um, so let's take a look at a tennis player who's now under pressure. And if this tennis, if this were your tennis player, and this was his score, I would say to you, Conrad, that under pressure, he's probably not going to take some risks. So he might not do exactly what you would expect him to do under pressure because this test is standardized specifically to measure two basic factors. One, which I've been talking about this whole time is where your attention is at the time you make the decision, and two, the interpersonal factors that will predict what those processes will influence. So we're looking at those two basic things, and I'm sure you would agree that where your attention is at the time of execution and how your personality influences how you handle pressure are the two best predictors of an outcome of performance. So this is the test. I have norms for tennis players, uh, tennis professionals, um, and for Olympic coaches, I'd like to share this with you and show you how it works. So yes, this is very, very effective. Um, there's no other test out there like this. This is, this is used in the NHL, the NBA, the NFL, the PGA. Um, and and I'm, uh, I was trained by Nidifer who actually designed the test. So yes, this, this is the test. And uh, talk to Matt about it. He'll tell you how accurate it is. Thank you, Nick. You're welcome. I'd love to have you have take a test. Any Dr. other questions? Dr. Molnaro, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, my name's Andrew and my son is um, at center court. He's 11. So how do you teach a kid to, because tennis is a weird sport. I played a lot of sports growing up. I didn't play tennis. And, um, but it has a weird sport because we put them on, you know, with the match and stuff. They go out there. They don't just talk to us. They're just out there the whole time. And they have to manage that level of arousal and stuff. And, um, at times, I notice he's un not aroused enough. He's not taking it seriously enough. And then at times when things go bad, they, I can see he's just frustrated. And trying to, but, you know, it's unlike when I was, when I played, you know, I played a couple sports when I was growing up, you know, we had a coach and they would manage you. So how do you sort of teach the kids or teach my own child or like, how do you work with it? He's 11, obviously, but as time goes on, how do you get them to manage their own level of arousal when we can't even, we can't talk to them when they're on the court? Or, you know, even signal to them. You can't signal to them, you know. You can't do anything. You just, it's completely completely on their own. Right. right. Well, that's what I do. I mean, so I work with uh, athletes uh, that age and, and uh, above. And so we are looking at, you know, the ability to shift attention and to train them. So we'll give them cues. Um, how do you keep your attention up? What are you actually thinking? And is your attention in the right place at the right time? So um, we uh, identify specific triggers that will help them do that. 
So for example, uh, you know, being able to loosen up. And so as you're, as you're getting ready either for the serve or you're getting ready to serve, uh, if, if for example, you're you know, bouncing a ball two or three times, um, the second time your focus will become even more intense. Um, if you found that there was a distraction, the first thing you should do is to immediately relax your body. So there will be training, uh, there are very specific cues that we train the athlete to that will then start to stimulate the kinds of things that you're talking about, how to increase arousal and how to, how to, manage, your, um, how to manage your attention. So we do that. So we do that by imagery. And so um, having, having them imagine what a video camera would see if their attention was at a very high level, what would that actually look like to them? And then inside their body, what does your body feel like when you're ready to serve? What does your body feel like when you're ready to run or to switch directions? And by training them off court and then being able to give them a cue that's going to trigger that, that's how we do that. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, it's a um, work in progress, I guess, for the kids, but. Oh no, it's a work in progress. I mean, so clearly when you look at developmental stages of 11 years old and their ability to concentrate, the human span of concentration is only 10 minutes. And so when you look at even uh, workouts and, you know, short periods of time versus longer, and then whether you're doing block training or serial training or, or then chaining, you know, behaviors, uh, skill sets together. So all of those factors uh, are significant. That training, the way in which they're trained is going to make a big difference in how they're going to be able to manage that once they're on the court. So, but that's what we'll do. And sometimes I'll go out onto the courts with the athletes, observe them and give them some instructions right there about how to do that so they'll know what to do once they're in competition. Well, it's helpful, thank you. Yeah, and I also coach the parents on how to, to stay out of that, so. Um, any other questions? Yeah, again, Dr. Nick, do, do you have any simple ways right now i mean we're all at home we're all with our kids i'm obviously a coach but also have my own kids that we can help our kids to become better at holding attention holding focus um for slightly longer periods i mean there's certainly the misconception that you can hold you know kids can hold 40 minutes of, of attention that's impossible so what can we do right now to help our kids later become better at you know um at holding attention Great. So uh, the, the process would be called mindfulness. And uh, so mindfulness is actually using your sensory mechanisms and shifting your attention to different portions of your sensory mechanisms to keep you focused. So for example, um, you can have your child staring straight ahead and then without moving their eyes, become aware of things to the right of them and things to the left of them in their vision. Uh, you can then move their attention to um, sensation um, of their feet on the floor or their hands clasped together. And then being able to shift their attention back again to other things. This is a good example of attentional shifting, which is necessary in open sports. Now, if you want to be able to sustain attention, um, if I showed you those four three-quarter circles, what I'd have you do is stay focused on that one. Um, and then introduce two or three more. And as you do that, maintaining focus without being able to see the square. So um, both in terms of being able to fix your attention on one system, uh, let's say your sensory system. So a tennis racket's in their hand. And just have them try to focus on that tennis racket, what that feels like, and then remove the racket, and then try to have them sense what that racket feels like as well. Now, during that process, you're going to be using what's called proprioception. They're going to start sensing things that they weren't sensing before. And by doing activities using different sensory mechanisms, touch, vision, auditory stimulation, and try to get them to sustain it for a longer period of time, but literally train that and not say, do this for 20 minutes. So let's do this for five minutes. Let's do this for six minutes. Let's do it for 30 seconds. How long can you keep your attention on the feeling of the tennis racket in your hand before you get distracted. And that will, that will help elongate that. Now also what you can do is a lot of visualization. So visualization uh, takes two basic forms. What, would, what do you actually see when you're playing the sport? So if you're playing tennis, what would you actually see? 
you know, as uh, your opponent. So you can start to imagine that. And then what would the video camera see? Kind of a head on view or side view of what you're doing and go through uh, examples of a, of a volley or, or of a round of golf. And using your imagination in doing that, you'll sustain your ability uh, to uh, extend that. Okay, any other questions? I had a question. I'm a, I'm a sixth grade STEAM teacher and I teach a lot of physical science about using sports in motion. And it's interesting to think about them in terms of closed and open sports. Do you think that having children have an awareness of whether they're more of an open sport or a closed sport person is helpful at this young age? Or, you know, that I'm just wondering, not, not all my students are athletes. I mean, we're always looking at learning styles and modalities. We do a lot of mindfulness and stuff, but I'm just wondering if uh, having them con uh, figure out their predilection at this age is appropriate um, being so young. Uh, how old are they? They're 11. Oh, no, it's not too young. Um, no, I think that they probably, I, I think you probably would be able to help them understand that just by watching what they do. So individuals that are having more difficulty being able to stay focused might be a good example of their shifting their attention quickly. And I'm not talking about attention, you know, um, ADD kind of thing. And people that can shift their attention very quickly are real good at open sports. And a lot of times you'll find athletes who have qualities almost ADD, like do much better at open sports than they do at closed sports. It's not always the case. Yeah, I think it might be interesting for you to have them imagine what is, to begin with, fun. Um, athletes by the age of 13, or children, let's put it this way, children at the age of 13, 70% of them will never play the sport that they're playing than ever again in their life, 70%. And the reason for that is that they don't enjoy it. So the first thing you have to find out is what they actually enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And I would look at you know sensory mechanisms too. You like quick motion, you like slow motion. Um, you like to make quick decisions, you like to make slow decisions. And so I think there's ways that you can do that. That might help them. I, I have an athlete now who, um, who's asked me, uh, you know, older of course, but when I take a look at his, his, um, his focus, his father wants him to be a golfer. Clearly, he'll, he'll be much better at tennis just because of what happens with his attention and he needs to move. So those would be some factors I think you can probably discuss with them. But pleasure is mo the most important point, most important factor at this point for an athlete to enjoy uh, between you know, 11 and 13. So we're still in this unit of looking at forces in motion and we're doing distant learning. So I try to keep them very busy physically uh, through the activities that they're assigned. And then of course there's a written component, but do you have anything in your like box of, of papers and things like that, that would be somewhat official that you could share that I could share with the students because uh, hearing it from an expert, always adds weight to their uh, enjoyment and engagement in the task. Um, so you're looking for an activity for them to do? Yeah, or if you have something already, like a survey or something like that, that would be, that would, I, I'm taking in what you're saying, but I'm also thinking if there's a resource that you might have that you could point me to versus my Google searching it. Uh, you know, I don't have anything offhand, but uh, you could always write me. Okay at uh, uh, Dr. Nick, at drnickmolinaro.com. It's, um, so mm -hmm. you'll see my name and it will be the easiest way and just uh, tell me who you are. So, uh, Eva? Is yes. It yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, if you do that, that might, um, I'll see what I can come up with. Thank you. Can uh, I follow up on that just a little bit? Because this is Andrew again, because huh. Eva was mentioning about like her students, but you know, I'm working about my kids and stuff. Is there any like, I mean, I just think it's so interesting with the like the kind of open and closed goes and really interesting stuff. Is there any like, you know, there's always like books about, you mentioned you had dyslexia, there's always books about dyslexia and stuff. Are there books about like, like kids books and stuff that talk about like, no, no, the stuff that you're talking about, but maybe in like a kid version, like, uh, or like a cartoon version, like, oh, you have to make decisions or something, or is that just not, it might just, that does not exist? 
I, I certainly wouldn't tell you it doesn't exist. I, I don't have knowledge of it, <laughs> but um, I, I, you know, uh, again, write me and I'll uh, check with some of my resources to see if we can come up with something that's like yeah. that. Um, it, what I certainly ought to tell you, both of you, you know, just because your children being so young, what's very, very important is that they're deriving pleasure. And um, sometimes the play, and kids will talk about this, um, boys talk about this more than girls do, but boys will talk about changing sport at the age of 13 or giving it up is because they're concerned that they're taking too much of their parents' time. And kids will say that they'll take too much time from mom for them driving around and from dad trying to live vicariously through them. So there's some really interesting research on, on children and sports and their interaction with parents. That might be something to take a look at as well. Um, but if you send me a, a note, uh, Andrew, I'll see what I can do. I will do that, thank you. Sure. Okay, any other questions? Hello, I'm wondering if you can hear me. So another question? Yeah, my name is Mark. Can you hear me, Dr. I, I can, Mark, yep. Oh, thanks. Um, Dr. Milliner, I'm wondering if I can write you because my um, Wi-Fi here in Toronto has gone in and out, so I, I only caught parts of it. I'm just wondering if this might be posted so I could catch it in entirety later. Yes, it is. It's going to... Um, uh, you can write me at Dr. Nick at drnickmullen.narrow.com. Okay. I know it's going to be sent out tomorrow to anybody who's been on uh, this. So if you've registered, you should receive a recording tomorrow. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Molinar, I'm wondering how, when you have, uh, for tennis, when you have uh, Roger Federer, what, what would you say is the biggest difference in um, that his eyes are seeing compared to, let's say, a club player, which affects his uh, decision-making? What, what would be the biggest uh, criteria, uh, criteria do you think between a pro and a, and a club player? I'm going to ask Conrad to answer that one because he's the expert and a professional tennis player. So, Yeah, thanks a, thanks a lot, Nick. I'm, I'm happy to answer that. I've been very fortunate to actually work with Roger Federer. Um, and I can tell you that the biggest thing at that level of sport is that it is literally three points that will make the difference in the outcome. Um, the amount of pre-competitive knowledge that the players today are taking into the match, being that they are studying, you know, individual patterns that their opponents are going to produce. And they know pretty much based on, uh, you know, thanks to technology and the simple way that a coach like myself can go and view a match on YouTube or anything and tag certain points. For example, uh, 30 all points, you know, if you're coming up against uh, a player uh, that you can watch their video, you will know what they're going to do. And they're not going to change that pattern. Um, in fact, they'll go even more primitive. They'll go even more basic when they're playing someone at a higher level than them. So that's one thing. It's Tennis is definitely a very, very open sport on the continuum. We know that. But at the pro level, it's gone to another level where – players are bringing knowledge into the court with them, knowing exactly what's going to ha most likely happen. And then they, they're trying to cover the high percentage opportunities as opposed, and they let those low percentages go. Club level players, they don't do that. The other big difference is that you talked a lot about anticipatory skill development. Um, anticipation is something that is so well trained at the highest levels of the game. We know from research in a sport like tennis that players are trained to watch the center of the body. They're watching the axis, central axis of the body. Um, whereas at the recreational levels, players are looking at the ball, which is, you know, it's already come out of the racket. So they're picking it up much, much later. Um, those subtle differences are trained at a very young age. The ideal developmental training window is between 12 and 15 years old mm -hmm. for those visual tracking, anticipatory skill development factors. Um, it's very complicated, very complex, but in a nutshell, the difference between a pro and a club level player is most of the time it's the intangibles that you cannot see. The yeah. technique, you can see stylistic differences, no doubt. 
However, the real differences are in the internal skill set. Okay, thank you. Um, can I? I'm glad you were here, Conrad. Thank you very much. Oh, I hope I hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you. May, may I do a quick follow up? Say again. Can I sure. do a quick follow up? Um, I don't know if this is for Conrad or Dr. Molinaro. When you're playing a point, should there be any thinking at all, or do you want your mind completely um, neutral or empty in tennis? I guess maybe Dr. Molinaro. I don't know. Dr. Right. Nick, do you want me to answer that? Uh, why don't you give your answer and I'll give mine? They might not be the same. <laughs> I, yeah. Again, at the highest levels of the game, um, players are playing off instinct mm -hmm. much more. They're, they're so well trained um, that once something happens, a stimulus occurs. Usually it's a ball or a player moving or something happens. They play off instinct. At the lower levels, um, certainly everything is, is trainable. So, um, you know, you want to be intentionally... Uh, focusing on the things that, you know, you can control. So that's going to be, you know, technical areas, your footwork, those things. Uh, we say there are two things you can control, feet and racket. So they're the things you should be controlling. But then when you get to the higher competitive levels, it's going to be all about what your opponent does and how they apply certain strategy and how well trained the player is to react to that strategy. Thank you. My answer would be uh, very similar. I would answer it from a more kind of psychological perspective, which is that you have to be present. And it can't be, you know, in terms of winning the point. It can't be in terms of the outcome of any of this. And so one of the most difficult things to do, I think, for a club player versus what a pro has been able to do is have the experience of what being in the moment actually is. And so I spend a lot of time on trying to help people understand what that experience is and uh, it would take me a little while uh, to get through that, but that's the way I would answer it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, okay, any other questions? Is it okay if I ask one more? Sure, I'm, uh, we're past the time anyway, but uh, <laughs> yeah, this is great. Should, should so you're talking about uh, the, all these sensory things. When you're playing tennis, then and, you're, and um, you've, you've hit the ball, you've watched it on your strings, should you be then uh, taking in everything as the ball's going to their side, watching the player, watching where he is? Should you be uh, taking in all these open, all this external stimuli to, to make your decision as to where to move, with to move in, to stay back? I, I, think, I think what Con Conrad was talking about is he described it as instinctive. Okay. And uh, my process is called intuitive and a little bit different. And what happens at a very high level of intuition um, is that it's a cognitive process. It's not emotional at all. And in the ability to do it in a split second that you have to do that, there's a self-reliance on that. So it's not even a question. So um, uh, you won't be telling yourself to do it. You will actually be doing it, which is the difference between thinking about doing it and being in the moment. Does that answer your question? Yes, that gives me good insight. Thank you. Conrad, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I think, I think that's a perfect answer. I mean, we say that uh, everything's done in the practice core, right? So, again, it's level dependent. If we're talking about tour level, that's something else. If we're talking about developmental age group, again, 12 to 15, you've got to train those things. Uh, right. A lot of people think that, players become, you know, just natural at reading the ball. That's absolutely not true. We know that the training occurs by doing. So um, if you are, you know, developing your own kids or, or players, you've got to throw in uh, exercises that force them to think because tennis is a decision-making sport. Whether, and the ball is only one element. So whether it be, is it coming high? Is it coming low? Is it coming wide? Is it coming close? Is it coming fast? Is it coming slow? Does it have top spin? Does it have back spin? You know, um, is it coming from a high angle or low angle? Are the courts quick? Are the courts slow? There are so many decisions that there is no way you can perform under competition if you're thinking about those things. You get into a match, you should not be thinking at all about the technical sides. And if you are, you haven't trained enough. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Excellent.
Anyone else? I'll just show you one other thing and then uh, we'll call it an, an evening. So um, some of the ways we are actually, some of the ways we're actually being able to gather the information is by using different systems. And this one's called HeartMath. I don't know, do you use HeartMath at all, Conrad? Okay, so HeartMath actually is found to show the relationship between breathing, heart rhythm, and brain rhythm. So although we're, this test is not actually measuring brain activity, there's a correlation between heart rhythm and brain rhythm. And so what we can find, as you can see in this coherent state, is that when things are respiration, heart rate, and blood pressure all together, the brain activity is functioning in a very different way. So we train athletes, you know, certainly before things begin, how to maintain those qualities by doing very specific techniques of breathing and visualization. So um, that's it. Well, thank you for your attention. Uh, I appreciate it. And Conrad, I'd love to do a session with you at some point. So. Anytime, Dr. Nick, I'd love to be a part of it. I think it's fascinating what you're doing. And just that last slide that you talked about there, we are in tennis, this is well known. And the great Nick Volateri uh, and the great Jim Lair back in the, in the 80s pioneered a lot of the heart rate, um, optimal training heart rates and things like that and how they relate to attention and focus, emotion and how the hormones are related to that. So it's definitely very interesting stuff and I'd, I'd love to help out anytime. Great. Um... Thank you for joining in this evening. I understand anyone who's been on this uh, this evening will get a copy of this. Uh, and um, if I could be of any help, they could reach out to me as well. Thanks for your time.